you made a point at the beginning about the definition of empathy, which I wanted to just underscore. You said that it is a mode of experiencing. It's not the capacity for that, but it's the moment in which you are. I think so, yes. And you distinguish that mode of experiencing from caring and sympathy, which are maybe correlated with empathy and, and are, but are not empathy. Before that, I would, I would say that we also can use empathy for cruelty. When we do yes. brainwashing, uh, when we sell cars to people who can't afford them, we're, we're using empathy to yes. empathize with them, and then we use it for some non-caring uh, end. I, I, I agree with you entirely. I think so. Empathy can be uh, sharing something which is actually negative as well as sharing something which is which is positive and appreciating. The functioning is one thing, but uh, uh, it, 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 is a, it is quite a wide term. And, uh, and I, I think that it is most important to say <coughs> you don't have empathy. Empathy is not something which is there all the time. At certain times, because of your thought processes, you have empathy. At other times, you have the capacity to have empathy, but you don't actually have it. So I think it's not the capacity, it's actually the process. The process. Any questions? Rav, uh, okay, yeah, sorry. First Rav, and then there's another question. In the back. Can you comment on the um, point about religion? It seems to make sense to me about the uh, group empathy and moral codes business. Yes. Theologically, however, I'm having a little bit of a problem uh, applying this to the monotheistic traditions of the West, where it would appear that the idea of God is largely something of something that's wholly transcendent, and so not something that we could put ourselves in the perspective of. Yeah. Uh, can you comment on that? Yes, I mean, I, I, what I presented was a personal view, and I, of course, appreciate I presented a personal view, and of course, I appreciate that uh, other people will have other views on that. Uh, so, it, it, it seems to me that uh, a, a spirit linking all sentient beings is, a, is a, a concept which fits with some people's idea of, what, of, of, of God, and that can still be in a, in, from a monotheistic perspective. It doesn't mean you can't have that view. Uh, so it's a, but I mean, the, what, what else is included in, the, in your concept of God? Uh, that is a matter for e each individual to consider, I think. But it's a, it, it seemed to me that it's useful to think about group empathy as being an aspect of it, at least. <coughs> What's the question? Please speak up because we can't hear you. So I would like to know. No, please, please. No problems. Excuse me, thank you. You can't take it far. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. I would like to know your opinion about where are we now with the protection of animals in, in the EU? Yeah. Because it seems that there is some kind of equalization between being a sentient being and well, but actually in Directive 63 of 2010, the, there is an extension toward uh, uh, invertebrate and also to uh, fetal animals in the third, last third, uh, which is an interesting construction. Yes. But this is because of what? Because they are more precautionary or because the boundaries are kind of moving between being sentient and wider concept of weapon. So uh, we, we have it in the, the, the legislation that we should protect sentient beings. That, 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 that's essentially what it says. But welfare is a different, welfare is a, is a concept which applies to any kind of animal and it's the state of the individual as regards its attempts to cope with its environment and that can apply to every human and every non-human animal but you can't apply it to inanimate objects or plants or uh, so, so it's, the, the, the words are not equated.
sentience. So sentience and welfare are not equated, and I think it's important that they are not. Um, because I think if, if, if there is an animal which doesn't have very high level cognitive functioning, uh, I still prefer not to harm it. So an earthworm, I prefer, I try not to harm earthworms. That doesn't mean I am crazy about it, but I, 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 I try. If I am gardening, I try not to harm earthworms. Uh, but the earthworm doesn't have uh, the capabilities of, 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 of a dog or a pig. So, but I would still, uh, I'm still concerned about the welfare of the, of, of the earthworm. And it does have mechanisms for coping with its environment, of course. Um, so, the, the two terms should not be confused. Uh, they're, 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 there are links, but they're not the same thing. But this is a potential for an expansion in protection. In the <coughs> yes, so the present situation in the European Union is that there, there, are, there is protection. When animals are the subject of experimental studies, there is protection for vertebrate animals and now for cephalopods and for fetuses in the last part of development, uh, last third of development. Um, and uh, the, that, what it means is, what an individual researcher has to think, if I am going to, if I'm going to do something which causes, potentially causes pain to this animal, I'm going to cut it harm it directly, physically, should I use a painkiller or an anaesthetic or an analgesic? That's a question which needs to, needs to be answered and I think we should, we all, anybody who is doing such a study should ask that. And I personally would certainly use anaesthetic and analgesic for some invertebrates now because it's absolutely clear that, uh, uh, that, that they have more, there is, there is a need for it with invertebrate species but it's not legally required. So there's a difference between what's in the law and what individuals will practically do. I, I, and there, are, there, is a, there is a large book on invertebrate anesthesia and analgesia, which you can, so you can find out how to do it for any kind of animal. That's just for laboratory work. Then we have other situations and we have other legislation in, in that case. But I think that test is a useful one. If you want to carry out this procedure with an animal, should you use an anesthetic or an analgesic? Each time, it's something to consider, I think. So even if it's a borderline sentient, I mean, yeah. you don't have, you have the potential, but not the, 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 if, the, if, the presence I of think, maybe of sentient. Exactly. Yeah. If you think it might be cause pain, then I would say use anesthetic or analgesic. Yeah. So it's a bit and do you know how much this has changed? Because until 1975, around that, Young babies were not given anaesthetic and analgesic when operations were carried out on them. Young human babies were not given it. And that, so that changeover is only 40 years ago. So all babies had operations without anaesthetic, almost all, had operations without anaesthetic and analgesic because it was thought they didn't feel it. And then it was discovered uh, that they do in fact uh, feel it. And now we have the same kind of question about uh, for veterinarians who are treating animals, do you use an anaesthetic? Do you use, an, if you're carrying out an operation, do you use a uh, pre-op uh, analgesic for, 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 these, for the animal or not? And there is a steady increase in the number of veterinarians who are doing this as a normal practice, whereas uh, some years ago, very few people did it. So there, we, we are changing how we are behaving towards young humans and uh, animals which are treated by veterinarians. More questions? Yes? I would like to know from a professor, in the empathic comportments in animals are due to education process or like in humans, like cultural or social factors. Whether the behavior of animals is due to, to uh, some uh, implication, problems, some, some problems of uh, like in humans, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, cultural or social or uh, uh, acquired. Uh, Well, I mean, the, 
first thing I would say is, is that all behavior is a consequence of uh, the genetic makeup and the experience of the individual. Whether we're talking about humans or, or, or non-humans, all, all behavior is related to genetics, all behavior is related to experience. So you can't divide behavior into, into uh, learned or, or innate. It's, it's, a, it's not a valid scientific distinction to make. Uh, everything is affected by experience to some degree. Some things more than others, but everything is expected. So I think that's part of your question. Is that right? And then if, when you look at the behavior of animals, uh, you can see the extent to which it is modified by the environment in which the individual lives. And learning is something which in our life and in the life of every dog or, 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 or mosquito, uh, learning is changing behavior during life. So all animals are learning things and they are learning quite very frequently during their lives. So they are being modified a lot by their experience during their lives. And, uh, and therefore there is a potential for many things to, to change and some of this occurs in very early experience. We know there are effects on, on the fetus inside the mother which can have consequences later, later in life uh, so the, the, the experience can occur very early and that's one of the reasons why when, when should the fetus be protected? Well, sometimes the fetus can be changed by what is happening to it uh, quite a long time before it's born or in the case of fetuses in eggs quite a long time before the egg is hatching. So there can be an effect of experience very early on uh, in, in life and can be quite a big and important effect as well. So we are learning a lot more about all these things uh, at the moment and there is a lot of new knowledge in this area. Other questions? I'm not clear why we should care for non-sentient beings. That is, if a being does not have the capacity to feel anything, um, why should we why should we care? Why should we care about its welfare? Well, the first the first part of that of my answer to that would be in some cases we we don't know enough. Uh, so there might be things which could fear things but we just didn't demonstrate it yet. And uh, you know, we, we have already extended the range of animals which we detect are, have capabilities of feeling pain and of having quite high level cognitive function. So, I mean, if you look at, if you look at spiders, if you look at the learning ability of the spiders, it's very impressive. However, the pain system, we don't yet know, we don't have good evidence that they have a pain system in the same way that, uh, that vertebrate animals do. So, uh, but, but uh, all of these animals, whether they have a pain, whether they have a, a complex pain system or not, they certainly have methods for trying to deal with their environment, so they can adapt to their environment. And they are using their brain. They have brains, and they are using their brains. Uh, so everything has some degree of cognitive ability, but some is rather simple, and some is more complex. So, I, but I would say I, uh, the word welfare relates to all animals because they all have this ability to. to to cope with the environment, to move, for example, all animals uh, can move away from something which is a negative experience, uh, and they can learn uh, things which are negative. And this applies to protozoa, to single cell animals, they can do that. Um, certainly it applies to nematode worms or earthworms or uh, sea anemones, they, they can uh, respond. It doesn't mean they have a complex appreciation of their environment, but they, they, can, they can respond to what's happening. Therefore, we can talk about their welfare, because they have systems for coping. So I think we should be concerned about all of these animals. But generally, people are more concerned about some animals than others. Okay, questions? Yes? Okay. Uh, what about vegetables and plants? Yeah. I am vegan and all the people, uh, I don't eat animals, and people say, okay, what about plants? I take it not seriously, not uh, most of the time, not seriously, not as a serious request. But now we are in a serious uh, ambient, yeah. and I would like, what about plants? Yeah. They doesn't suffer at all, or just, I don't know. Right, we, 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 plants do not suffer at all. 
I'm very confident in okay. saying that. So, plants don't have the mechanism, they don't have a central nervous system, they don't have nervous mechanisms which uh, would mean that they suffer when they're damaged. Uh, they can be damaged and they, they have, in some cases, repair systems for repairing some kinds of damage, uh, but uh, they, 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 are, they couldn't be aware of it because they don't have a nervous system. So I dif distinguish all animals from all plants because the plants do not have a nervous system. They, they can re there, are, there are things where the plants can react, so the, the, the sensitive plant, Mimosa pudica, when you touch it, it closes its leaves, so it has a mechanism for closing the leaves when it has a, a stimulation which it can detect. But it doesn't have a central nervous system, it doesn't have something which communicates to the rest of the plant. It's a localized, a localized effect. So, so I would completely distinguish plants from animals in, in, in that respect. But all animals have a significant central nervous system. So insects, worms, nematodes, uh, snails, they, are, they all have really quite sophisticated capacity for functioning. And I'm concerned about the welfare of all of those animals. And, I, and obviously inanimate objects don't have a nervous system. Bacteria and viruses don't have a nervous system. So my dividing line is having a nervous system. And that excludes plants, bacteria, viruses, and so on. So I don't talk about their welfare. I, my, I still have respect for individuals. So I have a respect. There is a, 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 a tree. That tree has taken many years to grow. I have personally respect for that tree. But in some circumstances, uh, but I wouldn't treat it as I would treat an animal. Yes, another question there. In ordinary language, can't we note when a plant is faring well or ill? We, we, we can see when it's uh, uh, dying of dehydration or yeah. uh, and so on. So yes, you, you, you can see whether it is uh, functioning well or not functioning well, but it doesn't have it doesn't have the, the, the central it doesn't have the nervous system. It doesn't have the capability of of controlling its interactions with its environment that an animal has. Is that more relevant to sentience or to welfare? Well, uh, it, it couldn't be sentient if it didn't have a central nerve, it didn't have a nervous system. <coughs> and I would also say that I'm not going to use the word welfare for something which doesn't have a nervous system. So I'm also not using the word welfare for a computer. Computer may respond. I have a computer which responds to things which I uh, I communicate with it, and it communicates back to me. But I don't talk about its welfare. Mm -hmm. There is an interesting question about whether there could be a computer developed which would, where you would have to. But at the moment, I don't because it doesn't have uh, it doesn't have the capacity that I would count as uh, being needed to use the word welfare. But I would use it for all animals. But we should explore these things. Exactly. We should ask the question about the plants, as you said. 